Hey, how many of you all know that uh, it's not easy to love people? Right? And some of y'all are like sitting next to your husband and wives and be like, hey, man, y'all got in a fight on the way here. And you're like, I don't even know if this thing's going to work out by the end of the day. We'll see how tonight goes. But it, it's not easy to love people, especially those that you feel like, um, what's the nice way to say this? Need a little bit of extra love? Is that the nice way to say it? They need a little bit of extra love, care. Um, they just require a little bit more. And sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. Parents, you know what I'm talking about because you got little ones at home that are constantly needing a little extra love, a little extra this. Nine times out of ten, it's actually a little extra money, but they try to pull everything that they can. Listen, Carter is only three. He turned three last week, and he's already costing me an arm and a leg. Uh, so those of you guys with teenagers, I feel for you. You guys with multiple teenagers, I really feel for you. I don't know why or how y'all did. Well, I know how you guys did that. But anyway, that's another thing. That's another deal. That's another topic for another day. But loving people can be difficult. But that is exactly what we are called to do. That's exactly uh, how we're supposed to live our life. We're supposed to live it in a way that reflects back to who we serve in that that's Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior who, who died on a cross for our sins and poured out his love for us, then we should then in return go and pour out that same love to those around us. And uh, we have a theme verse for this series, and, and Pastor Jason talked about it last week, but in case you weren't here, it's John 3, or 13, 15. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. No greater love than this. Then when we go out of our way to, to put a little bit more effort into a relationship, then we go out of our way to serve one another. Then when we go out of our way to do something that may be a little bit uncomfortable for us, but it's needed at the time for the other person. That's the greatest thing that we can do. That's the greatest love that we can put forth. I put it like this. How many of you guys are mourning people in here? Okay, I see a few hands, barely, but I do see a few hands. How many of y'all are like, I'm sleeping in until it's at least double digits on the clock? Yeah, me too. Um, doesn't really happen anymore. So my wife, she's a morning person. She's one of those weirdos that's like, we're wasting time by sleeping. It's not a waste of time to sleep. Who says that? That's a, that is the perfect time to get the rest that I need, to relax. Okay, I'm not wasting time. I am enjoying life when I am sleeping. That is just the best thing that you can do. But she likes getting up and getting going. And uh, when we first started dating and then got married, her family is Hispanic. And so um, they have these different types of pastries and stuff that they really love. There's a shop in, in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and I, I would try to pronounce the name of it, but I would butcher it because I, I, I can't speak Spanish. And so I'm just not even going to try. Um, but in order to get the good pastries, the good bread that we like, uh, you got to get up at the butt crack of dawn to get there because it runs out fast. By the time that you get there at like 6 a.m., there is a line out the door at this place. Like, it's crazy. It's insane. So being the good husband that I am, because I'm a great husband, just in case anybody wanted to know. It's not funny, guys. I am, okay? Don't laugh. My wife might say different, but... Being the good husband I am, I woke up at 5 o'clock, got ready real quick, went down there, got in line, got the pastries home, brought them back, and we got to enjoy this delicious bread that we enjoy eating. It's kind of like a donut together. And that was kind of, uh, it was hard in the sense I had to wake up early but it was easy because I got a reward out of it too, right? And many of us, that's kind of how we live when it comes to loving people around us. Is we're actually willing sometimes to do the hard, the difficult things that it takes to love someone as long as I'm getting something else out of it as well. Right? Like I'm just being honest, like that's me, hello. Like we've all been there. We've all been in the spot where you say, well, I'm going to do this, but... I'm going to need this in return. I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to need this. You know, when, when I call you, then you're going to have to do this for me. And that's just simply not the way that it's supposed to be. We're supposed to love because, again, that's who we are. That's who Jesus is. And if we proclaim to be Christians, if we proclaim that we love Jesus, then the love that Jesus poured out on the cross for us should, would, should just pour out 
in our lives to the people around us. It should be a continual fountain, so to speak. But many of us, we get so tired throughout the week, we get so frustrated throughout the week, we feel worn down, we feel beat down, and we don't have anything to give. Why? Because we are not filling our own love tank to start with. How do we do that? For many of you guys, you guys would say going and doing, you know, something that I enjoy and and going and resting and doing those things. And those things are great. And yes, I believe that those help fill us back up and get us ready to go for life. But the most important thing that we can do in life is simply this. Are you spending time in the word and are we praying? Are we talking to God? Are we finding out what the word of God says about the way that we should love people, the way that we should chase after people, the way that we should serve people? And as we go through this series, Greater Love, I hope that we all can walk away. And I've been challenged with this as, uh, as I've been preparing this week. I don't know about Pastor Jason, but normally as, as I'm preparing for a message, God really starts to mess me up. He starts saying, hey, that's great. You're getting ready to go talk to people about this. But did you do this this week? And so I've been really challenged the past two weeks uh, leading up to today and, and talking about what can I do to love people greater. And today I'm hoping that I can be a little bit short today, get you guys out of here so that you guys can go and, and you guys can uh, get ready for your party that you're going to have tonight. Uh, and so uh, we're going to try to fly right through this. But I, I want today for us, our understanding to come out of this. The thing that I want us to, to pull away from today is this, is doing a good thing with the wrong attitude will never equal love. If you do a good thing, but you're complaining about it the whole time, you're frustrated, you're, you're angry, whatever it may be, just because we do a good thing, it doesn't mean that it's coming from a place of love. A good deed is not always the right thing. A good deed, it, it, it's a, just that, it's a good deed. We don't want to just simply do good deeds as, as Christians, as people who are believers. We want to push forward and we want to love more and we want to give more and we want to serve more. And we want that to come from a place of genuine love. A love that we say, man, I've, I've been given so much grace. I've been given so much mercy. I've been forgiven time after time after time because Jesus died on a cross for my sins. So I want to in return turn around and pour that out to the next person. But oftentimes we get so wrapped up and caught up in our own life and our own frustrations that we say we want to love and we say that we love certain people, but do we love everyone? The Bible says in 1 John 4, 20, uh, verses 20 through 21, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he's a liar. If we won't love the per- if If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Tough. Not easy to do. Sometimes people get on your nerves. Sometimes that person at work, they just, they keep yelling at you all day, or they just talk all day, or they complain all day. It's not easy. But let us not be a church that says, I love God, but I can't stand people. Right? How many, um, don't don't raise your hands on this. Don't raise your hands on this. It may not be a good thing to raise your hand on. But how many of y'all don't like people, right? Like you say that all the time. You may not necessarily mean it, but some of you guys actually might mean it. But sometimes we just say that and it just becomes something that we say and sometimes we don't even think about it. How many of y'all know those should never be things that come out of our mouth if we say that we love God? Because if I love God, then I need to love people. I need to love people in their mess. I need to, I need to love people in the middle of their lies. Some of y'all have stopped loving people simply because you've been lied to a lot. And I get it, it's hard. And I'm not saying relationships have to stay the same. That's something totally different. But we don't need to go bad-mouthing people all the time. We don't need to go gossiping about people all the time because that's not showing love. That's not showing grace. We need to be ready and willing every single day to pour out as much love as possible because we have been forgiven. What would the church look like if we would simply stop for a moment and love the way that we're supposed to? You don't have to look very far in the world to know that now more than ever, we live in a world that needs a church to rise up and really 
be the forefront of how we love. We need to be the leaders in loving people. We need to be the ones who are out on the front lines, holding people, bringing them in, letting them know everything's going to be okay, that there's a God that loves them. And for a, a very long time, the Big C Church, I'm not just talking about here, but the Big C Church all across the world has been way more known for what we don't like than who we love. Oh, well, I don't like that you do this. Or I don't, as Christians, we don't do that. Oh, uh, you can't do that once you become a Christian. Our verbiage needs to change, and it just simply needs to say, hey, I love you right where you're at. Why do I love you right where you're at? Because Jesus loves you right where you're at. And if I've been forgiven, he can forgive you too. He can give you a new start. He can give you a fresh life. We have to change our verbiage. We have to change the way that we think. Because now more than ever, as society is a mess, there's different countries that are in ruins. Now more than ever, the church needs to step up and be the loudest voice that people hear. And the voice they need to be hearing is a voice of love, not hate. The voice that needs to be shouted from the mountaintops is a voice of love that says, hey, I love you in the middle of your mess. And even more than just saying it, I'm going to step in the mess with you. Go the extra mile. In the New Testament, Jesus is constantly trying to teach people about what it means to love. Constantly, story after story that we read, it's, it's a story of Jesus coming forth and saying, hey, this is how we do this. This is how we do this. This is how we go about this. And there's a story that if you've grown up in church for any amount of time, you've heard it before. If you haven't heard it, we're getting ready to go over it. And it's found in Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. And Jesus He's getting ready to tell uh, what we call a parable. Parables are stories that uh, Jesus would use to, to preach to whatever crowd he was with at the time. So if he was preaching to farmers, he would tell a story about farmers. If he was preaching to, to people that dealt with money and finances, he would, he would talk about finances. And he would use stories to kind of help them understand what this story was about. And so he's sitting here and he's talking to a, a crowd and, and there's some religious scholars that are in the crowd. And so he's trying to make a point here with them. And so again, Luke 10 through uh, 25 to 37 says this, just then a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said, that you, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion, prayer, and muscle, and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Good answer, Jesus said. Do it, and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, which, by the way, is never good to do with Jesus. He will always get you. There is no loopholes. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled, his, he angled a cross to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave, him first, he gave him first aid, disinfecting, uh, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey and led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded, Jesus said, go and do the same thing. So here's Jesus. He's, he's talking to this group of, of religious leaders. And what you have to understand at the time, these religious leaders were people who thought they were better than everyone else. They are the ones who held the law. They kept the law. They made different laws. And so they held themselves above everyone, thinking that I'm just better because I know the law better, because I helped create the law better, whatever it was. And so all the time, these religious leaders, they're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to catch him in something. They're, they're trying to make him stumble over the word of God, right? Because these religious leaders, they knew, they knew the word of God. They knew what the word said. And so they were constantly trying to make sure that Jesus was who he said he was and trying to trick him into saying something that he shouldn't so that they could then 
turn him in. And Jesus is talking to them, and he, he brings up these three different people. Talks about how they all treated this man. This man that was attacked, this, mean, this man that was left to the side, this man that was almost dead. And we get to the end, and the first two religious people, they didn't want anything to do with him. They looked the other way, they passed him by, they said, yeah, I, don't, I don't really care. I'm going to go and do whatever I'm on my way to do because i got more important things. But then here comes the Samaritan. And you got to understand at the time, the Samaritans were people that were not liked. There was hatred towards them. No one liked the Samaritans. But here's the Samaritan man who comes along, helps him up, cleans him up, takes him, takes him to an inn, pays for everything that he would need. And then on top of that, says, hey, I've already paid you. Uh, but whatever else this guy needs, let me know. I'll take care of it. And in this picture that we, we get, this story that we get, is the perfect picture of how we should live our lives as Christians. It's the perfect representation of the way that we should walk, the way that we should talk, the way that we should go about our day-to-day life. You see, too often we get so wrapped up in what we're doing, what we're focused on, that we totally miss the point of why we're here. And so I've got two things that we're going to learn from the story today, and again, that we're going to get out of here. And number one is this. Is see the need and fill it. Our jobs as Christians is to see the need that is in the world and, and to go out and fill that need. You already know it. Let's just go do it. We don't have to have someone wait, you know, and say, hey, can you go and do this? Hey, can, can you go and you, can you serve over here? Can you love this person? Can you? We've already been commissioned. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, which means to love, which means to pour out grace, which means to pour out mercy. That's already been commissioned. We've already said, hey, go out and love people. And again, it's not hard to look out your window, to look on your phone and see that we are in a world that needs love. The Samaritan man did not wait around for anything else. He just saw the need and he met the need. He said, hey, you need a little bit of extra love today. I can do that. I can go out of my way to do that. He didn't care about the inconvenience. He didn't care what it was going to cost him. He just said, there's a need and I can fill it. And unfortunately, again, the, the, the church as a whole, I think we've kind of backed off of that and we've gotten so wrapped up in our programs and our things that we're doing, the things that we're hosting, the events that we're throwing, that we forget that there's a world outside these doors that need us to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. There's a world outside these doors that need us to love more than we ever have in the past. There's a world that needs us to step up and lead the way. We can't sit on the sidelines anymore. Those days are done. Those days are over. We can no longer sit and wait for change to come to us, we got to bring change to the world. And the Samaritan man, he, he stopped and he said, hey, I, I'm here to help. What can I do? I look at it kind of like this. I, I talked about Carter a second ago. Excuse me. I talked about Carter a second ago. He turned three last week. And I think oftentimes as the world, we, we see people as they're in their struggles, as they're in their hurt, as they're in their pain. And we kind of just look at them and say, hey, just deal with it. Grow out of it, you know, fight through it. Whatever you got to do, just do that. I, I kind of look at the same way as this as my three-year-old son. That as he's been learning to do different things and he's walking, you know, just fine now as he's three, but he's, now he's graduated from walking to jumping off of everything, which I blame Pastor Jen for because... When he goes to her house, there are no rules. He got to go over there one time for youth, and uh, he comes home, and he's jumping off my couch out of nowhere. I'm like, bro, we don't do that here. What are you doing? And he just laughs, of course, and keeps doing it, and then we have to discipline. And 
talking to Jen and I'm like, hey, Carter's doing this. And he was, I can't believe that. She goes, yeah, that's my fault. I'm like, Jen, what? You can't let them do that. But of course, at Uncle Jason and Jen Jen's house, the boy gets whatever he wants. It's ridiculous. But my point is this, is that there's moments that Carter will be doing something he's not supposed to be doing. And he ends up getting hurt because of it. He'll jump off and hit something and he's hurting. And Some of you may have grown up this way. I didn't, so this is how I parent. But how messed up would it be if I just, while he's down, I'm like, ha, 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 you shouldn't have done that. And then I kick him while he's down. Y'all would be like calling DFS on me by, hello, come get this guy, right? No, as a, as a parent, I go over, I help him up, I say, hey, you're okay. You're okay, you're fine. Nothing's broken, we're okay. Keep moving forward, keep, you know, keep trying again, whatever it may be. But oftentimes we look at the people in our family, our friends, that one parent that said that thing at that game that now we don't talk anymore because they were running their mouth too much. The neighbor that the dog won't shut up at midnight because they just let him out at the worst times ever. And oftentimes we look at those type of people, the ones that we don't show much compassion for, much love for, and we kind of laugh at their pain. We laugh at their misery. Hey, well, you deserve that. You shouldn't have gone and done that. If you weren't doing this, then that wouldn't have happened. And Jesus is saying, man, that's that's not the way that we're supposed to live. That's not the heart that I want us to have. We want to have a heart of compassion. We want to have a heart that serves others no matter what is going on. I want to be challenged. I want to do better in serving those that don't serve me. I want to be better. I want to be challenged in in loving those that talk bad about me. That run my name through the mud. But guess what? I don't care because if you did not make me, then you cannot break me. And the only thing that I'm worried about is Jesus is calling on my life and where he's asking me to go and what he's asking me to do. We get too wrapped up and too worried about what other people are saying and thinking and all these different things, which causes us to not love the way that we need to love. But we really need to work on just loving in spite of everything that someone does to us. They do you dirty? Cool. I forgive you. I love you. They say this about you? Cool. I forgive you. I love you. We should constantly be pushing ourselves to have a greater love a greater understanding of what that love truly is. We should push to be more like the Good Samaritan. Number two, go above and beyond. Go above and beyond your love. Go go past the point that you think, oh, I did it good enough. The Samaritan, literally, he could have just helped the guy up and been like, hey, I helped you up, checked on you, make sure you're okay. Uh, he, he went further than that. He, he, bandaged, he bandaged him up. He, he put him on his donkey. He took him somewhere that he could rest and get the help that he needed. Then he even took it a step further and he, he paid for all of his bills. And he said, hey, I'm gonna, here's some money on my way back. I'll pay for whatever else needs to be covered. He went above and beyond the call of duty. And that's exactly what we are supposed to do every single time. How can I love a little bit deeper? How can I love a little bit greater? How much further can I push this thing? I want people to know me for being generous, for being kind, for for loving. I don't want people to know me as someone who is cold and closed off and doesn't love and just talks about people. I want people to know me for the love that Jesus poured into my life. Which means go in the extra mile because that's exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he could have easily called down a legion of angels to take care of everything that was going on in that moment. But he didn't. He stopped and he said, God, I know that this is the only way. So your will be done in this moment. 
and he died on the cross so that you and I and everyone else can know what everlasting life truly is. And as we receive that love daily, as we receive that grace daily, we are supposed to go out and give above and beyond. We need to stop looking at it like a chore. We need to stop looking at it like something that we have to do because it's love is not something that we do. It's who we are called to be. Is there action behind love? Absolutely. But I think that when we look at love as something that we have to do or something that we do, it almost becomes like we create a checklist. And once we've met our quota for the day of loving people, we stop. We say, ah, well, I was nice to that person, so you, I don't have to be nice to you. I already met my quota for the day on niceness, I'm good. Oh, I gave that guy a dollar, so I don't have to give you anything because we're good. Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know what it is. But I think oftentimes when we look at, at love as, as something that we do all the time, it just becomes something that we can check off our list for the day and we can move on. And when you look at it, not as something that we do, but something that we are called to be. When we change our mindset to shift it that way, it's no longer a chore, but it's an honor. It's my honor to serve people. It's my honor to love on people. It's my honor to go out of my way to make sure that my neighbor is taken care of. Who's your neighbor? Anybody that you walk across at the store, that's your neighbor. Anybody that you come in contact with, that's your neighbor. And it is my honor that I get to go out and love people the way that Jesus loves me. And when we shift our mindset from doing to being, it changes everything. There's a pretty uh, commonly used verse in weddings and things like that that talks about love. And you normally hear it in context of relationships and this is what, you know, you're dating, your marriage, whatever it may be. You're, they, they, this is how you should love in those things. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. It should be something that we live out daily. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 13, it's verses four through seven. It says, love does not give up, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not put itself up as being important, love has no pride, love does not do the wrong thing, love never thinks of itself, love does not get angry, love does not remember the suffering that comes from being hurt by someone, love is not happy with sin, love is happy with the truth, Love takes everything that comes without giving hope, or giving up, sorry, give hope. Love gives hope. Love believes all things. Love hopes for all things. Love keeps on in all things. I love the way that the message version of the Bible says that there. It kind of spells it out in very black and white. Hey, this is how we love. This is how we do this. And I want to challenge you as I've been challenged this week is maybe take this verse and put it somewhere where you can see it daily. Take this verse and maybe it's in the car, maybe it's somewhere before you walk out the door to go to work or if you're working from home, put it on your computer, whatever it may be. And let this verse be the anthem for our life as Christians. Let this birth verse be something that we can recite day after day after day and it just becomes a part of who we are because I am tired of being known for what I don't like and I want to be known as someone who loves deep I want to be known as someone who cares so much more than everyone else why because Jesus cares about people and when we said Jesus come into my life I want you to be my Lord and Savior we now said I love people above all else it's not easy, it's messy, it's hard. There's gonna be moments that you're going to wanna feel like you're getting offended. But we have to take moments to push through those times because our job never ends. There's always more for us to do, there's always someone else that we can love. We need to go and love our neighbors best way to know who I need to love 
is if the person next to you is still breathing and their heart's still beating, you need to love them. As long as there are people on this earth who don't know the love of Jesus Christ, that is our responsibility to take hold of a greater love and go out and show that to the world. And I wanna challenge all of us today. Who do I need to show a little bit more love to today? Who do I need to show a little bit more compassion to today? Who do I need to go out of my way to serve? Maybe it starts in your home. Maybe for you, it just needs to start at home and you need to love on your your spouse a little bit more. You need to love on your kids a little bit more. Teenagers, maybe it starts with you and you need to love your parents a little bit more by being more respectful. Then from there, as your family starts to really learn what it means to love inside the household, it'll pour out of the house and we can go out and we can start changing our community for the better. At VCC, we have a saying, community is our middle name. We want community to be a, community to be a part of everything that we do. But if we're a church that doesn't love, no one's going to want to be a part of it. And we want this to be a safe haven for people that come in that have been beaten down, they've been broken down, they've been left at the side of the road, and we're going to be the ones that come up, pick them up, bandage them up, and say, you're going to be okay, we're going to walk this thing out together. Pastor Jason can't do it on his own. I can't do it on my own. It has to be a team effort. If you're sitting in this room today, you're watching online, you're a part of the team. It's going to take a team effort to go out into this community and love people a little bit more. The question that you need to ask is when I leave conversations, when I leave situations with people, do they think of Christians better or worse because of me? Because of my life, Do people see Jesus or do they see hate? Do they say anger? Do they see disgust? Who do they see? I pray that all of us, our life would reflect Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're gonna be perfect all the time. We're gonna mess up, we're gonna make mistakes. But that's where the grace of God comes in and covers a multitude of sins. I wanna challenge you this week. Who can you go and find and serve a little bit better this week? Who can you go and love a little bit more? And when we all do that, when we all play a role in this thing called life, we're going to see the city of Grain Valley and the surrounding areas, and that'll continue to trickle out. We're going to see that forever changed. But maybe you're in here today, maybe you're watching online, and you've never even received the love of Jesus. So... This whole thing is new to you. You say, Caleb, I I don't know about that. How can I love people if if I don't feel like I'm loved? I want to tell you today, you are loved. There's a man named Jesus Christ who died on the sins for for your cross, or died on the cross for your sins. Flip that. And he did that so that you can know everlasting life and and, and spend eternity in heaven. But he also did that so that you can have hope in this life that we're in today. There's hope for a better tomorrow with Jesus. He wants to bring relationships into your life to help you push through the tough times you may be walking in today.